May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O God, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. There are threads that run through our lives, some of which are complex and some which are more simple. Often, they are things that connect us over time and space with those who came before us and with those whom we journey with through this present moment. If we look closely, we may begin to see how those threads are weaving their ways into our future lives. One thread that comes to mind is bread. Fresh baked bread. Just say the words, fresh baked bread, and one is transported. The aroma of the yeast, the kneading of the dough, the taste of warm bread in one's mouth. Bread awakens our senses, and it has the power to spark memory, to satiate and fill us, and to foster connection between us. In her book, The Spirituality of Bread, Donna Sinclair writes, as Jesus connected with his friends and as we connect with one another, bread also offers connection. People of every culture are tied together by the breads they bake because bread helps us to remember who we are and whom we love. In the making of bread is found the wisdom of the hands, the meditative work of kneading and shaping the dough is an invitation to slow down, to witness, and to be present as one considers the mystery of how something seemingly so simple can become something that feeds us in many ways. Another thread that runs through our lives as Christians is Jesus. His presence, his love, his promises. Each time we gather for worship, even in a virtual setting, Jesus invites us not only to connect with him, but to see him for who he is. To come and to see again the one who draws us in so that we might be known and filled and fed. From the moment that Jesus called his disciples, he had been gradually making himself known to them. Like a trail of breadcrumbs, he drops a morsel of himself here and there along the way, each bite offered as food for the disciples' souls and each with the intention of expanding their understanding of who he is and what he has come to do. It is by and in Jesus' preaching and his teaching, his healing and his self-revelation, that Peter and the others will come to realize who Jesus is, that he is the Messiah, that he is the Christ. And so, as devoted disciples who are beloved and trusted by Jesus, the three trek up the mountain with him, and before their eyes, something scary and strange happens. Mark writes that right before them, Jesus was transfigured. His clothes become dazzling white, whiter than bleach. And then he writes, Elijah and Moses came into view in a deep conversation with Jesus. We can see that there is this profound moment where we can see Jesus and his past, the prophets before him, Jesus in the present illuminated before us, and Jesus in the future in his disciples. Can you imagine 
can we begin to imagine the fear and the shock, their minds scrambling to process everything that they've just seen and to make sense of something that makes no sense? Certainly Jesus has surprised them before, but nothing like this. Jesus in this moment is more than the disciples could imagine, more than they could think. What they witnessed was beyond words. And although there is nothing asked of them, nothing for them to do, but to bear witness and to behold God before them, in his terror, Peter does something very human. Without thinking, he interrupts and he tries to take control of the situation. He tries to do something because he doesn't know what to do or what to say. Most of us can relate with Peter. Most of us have had moments of shock and surprise in our lives and not known quite how to react or exactly what to say or do. And as if to respond to the unspoken question rolling around Peter's brain, what the heck is going on here? God then bursts through in love and says, this is my son, the beloved, and listen to him. And as quickly as it came, the moment is over. They're alone again with Jesus. They retreat down the mountain, and he swears them to secrecy, that they're not to speak of this until the Son of Man has risen from the dead, whatever that means to them. He leaves them to ponder and to think about what they've just seen and witnessed. This moment of Jesus' revelation in radiance and brightness and glory, the transfiguration, is nestled in our church year between the end of the season of Epiphany and the beginning of the season of Lent. It is an event that invites us to look back and to look forward. If we gaze in our rearview mirrors, we will see Jesus coming into the world and the arising of his ministry. And if we get out our binoculars, we can look and catch a glimpse ahead of a road that will go through the wilderness to Lent and to Jesus' death and beyond, just a little bit beyond Jesus' resurrection. Tucked in between Elijah and Moses and the Son of Man risen from the dead, we find Jesus in the present. We find Jesus who is transfigured and in this moment reveals himself, his full self, as the one who can connect us to our past and who can guide us into our future if only we will meet him in the present. In the transfiguration, we see the Jesus who was, who is, and is to come. We see him transfigured before our eyes, and we also hear the voice of God reassuring us and inviting us into our own transformation of heart. There is a saying by the Sufi poet Rumi, which speaks to this invitation. He wrote, let yourself be silently drawn by the strange pull of what you really love. It will not lead you astray. As we come seeking to connect with Jesus every week, God calls us to open our eyes and to see and to sit in awe before him. Nothing to do, 
just to come, just to be in the moment. For when we allow ourselves to be silently drawn into the sometimes strange and inexplicable pull of the one we love most, Jesus, we can trust that he will not lead us astray. Like a loaf of freshly baked bread that awakens our senses, God, through Jesus, has broken in and desires connection with us so that we might see him for who he is and that by him and in him we may be fed. Amen.